Hi there, this video is about an interesting chip, the MPR121, which sports the impressive title of Proximity Capacity Touch Sensor Controller. I'm investigating this chip to provide a button interface for the Pi Moroni Enviro Plus board for the Raspberry Pi. If you recall from my previous videos, links in the description. The Enviro Plus board covers the complete I.O. connector of the Raspberry Pi. You can't access spare GPIO pins, but the I2C bus is still accessible. The Enviro Plus board has lots of environmental sensors, but the only one that is really suitable for use to trigger an action like a button is the proximity detector, which uses reflecting infrared light. One button would make a pretty horrible user interface, so can the MPR121 come to the rescue? I've got the idea to try out the MPR121 when browsing through the Adafruit website while searching for a solution for my problem. As you can see, the board has an I2C interface on one side and 12 sensor connections on the other. The price on the Adafruit website was $7.95 US, which was pretty much the same in British pounds plus shipping when you buy from one of the Adafruit distributors. And what do you get for that money? The MPR121 chip on a breakout board of course, but since that chip is for maximum 3.3V supply voltage, Adafruit made their board 5V compatible by adding a 5V to 3V regulator and two I.O. converters for the SDA and SCL signals. Oh, and the board has proper holes for mounting. I mention all this because this is the board I actually bought from eBay for 2 points 89 delivered within 3 days of ordering. You get the breakout board with the MPR121, but that is it. No 5V compatibility or mounting holes. Well, for the Enviro Plus, 3.3V are available, so 5V compatibility is not an issue, and I decided I'll figure out something for mounting eventually, if I even decide to use it. Like the Adafruit board, this comes with pin headers to be soldered in. Everything is clearly labeled and pretty self-explanatory. The black solder mask makes it a bit tricky to check traces because I'm looking where I can drill the missing mounting holes. It looks as if there's space on the left side, above and below the six pins for the I2C interface. On the top you can just make out one wire which may be only a redundant one for the ground plane, but with careful drilling it is just possible to avoid that wire. The header available on the Enviro Plus has only 3.3V ground, SCL and SDA, so the IRQ pin on the MPR121 will not be used. The ADD pin allows to select four different I2C addresses depending on whether it's open or tied to ground or to SDA or SCL. I will leave it open, which selects hex 05A as the address for the MPR121. So what is the MPR121? For this and the next couple of images I rated a nice presentation by Freescale, the link to it and other documents are in the description. So in a nutshell, this chip has 12 electrode interfaces, each of which can be a capacitive sensor but it can also be configured as a standard GPIO or to drive an LED, but of course not all at the same time. There is a 13th virtual electrode which is based selectively on the effects of the first two, first four or all 12 of the individual electrodes together. The idea is that this large virtual electrode can be used to trigger something if you just get into the proximity of the touch sensor area. Each of the 12 sensors forms a capacitor, one plate being the electrode and the other whatever is in the proximity, for example air or your finger. It is important to note that you don't need to make physical contact with the sensor. It is designed to work just by proximity and through isolating material, for example a printed circuit board. For each sensor the chip goes through these four steps. Ensure that the electrode is discharged by grounding it, then charge it for a selectable time, then measure the voltage and discharge it back to zero. By default it repeats this cycle every 16 milliseconds. Without touch, 
The voltage and therefore the capacity measured for each sensor depends on a lot of things, like the size of the electrodes, the dielectric material used to isolate them from each other and the user, wiring and so on. So with differently shaped electrodes, the at rest value will be somewhat different for each sensor. This at rest value is referred to as the electrode's baseline. In addition, there are changes in capacitance based on static, humidity, temperature and so on, so the baseline changes over time. The MPR121 implements a rather complex and fully configurable mechanism to automatically adjust each electrode's baseline for these effects, while suppressing changes caused by noise. This is shown in the upper graph, and there are several application notes available explaining the method and the effects of the adjustable parameters like NCL, MHD and so on. Touches are detected as drops in the baseline that exceeds configurable thresholds. This is shown in the second graph. But the binary touched not touched data is not the only thing an application can read from the MPR121. The filtered ADC values for each electrode are accessible as 10-bit values on the I2C. This allows, for example, calculating 2D positions as shown here. The red E0 to E3 represents four electrodes arranged in a square. If your finger would be at the location of the green, yellow or orange circle, the effects on the ADC values would allow you to approximate these positions. Note that I had to retraw the bars on this diagram because for whatever reason the original presentation shows the effects of touch on the ADC count reversed from what I observed in my experiments. I would also like to point out that this is still highly idealized. It does not take into account that the baseline no touch value is slightly different for each sensor and all baselines drift potentially slightly differently over time. Further, the actual effect is much smaller. In my experiments, for example, the baseline was around 730 and in the yellow E2 case dropped to only around 550. So yes, interpolation is possible to program, but not that easy, accurate and reliable. Some ideas on shapes of electrodes for different purposes. I was particularly intrigued by the linear slider, especially the one here on the left, and I gave that one a try. The white sheet is normal printer paper laminated because that is what I would use for a front plate. The electrodes on the back are kitchen foil. Unfortunately, I did not think of making a video of the underside, but you can just make out that the two upper electrodes form a slider and the two lower ones go to simple rectangular buttons. You see that the two squares on the Enviro Plus display show the button status. While the color of the circle is interpolated from the ADC values of the two slider electrodes, It does sort of work. Of course, like with the slider, nothing stops you from touching multiple sensors simultaneously and the MPR one to one response as expected. By the way, the white numbers on the display indicate which electrode was touched. The electrodes are hard to see, so I drew their outlines on a piece of paper. It should be possible to sense touch even through the additional layer of paper. Yes, buttons and the slider work as before. You can touch electrodes directly, like here, where I touch the pins of the board and it is still recognized. When you start writing software for the MPR one to one and take a look at the datasheet, you get a shock at the massive register footprint. No less than 128 registers are accessible from the ITC, I2C bus and about half of them need to be configured in some way. The reason for that explosion is that everything from thresholds to noise counts and Filter settings need to be set up and configured for each of the 12 actual sensors and for the virtual 13th electrode as well. 
There is an MPR one to one driver available from Adafruit, but I did not like it because it seemed to be more like a proof of concept and is very limited in what it allows the user to configure. So I rolled my own driver, which you can download from my GitHub page. I also want to quickly mention that the MPR one to one datasheet is definitely not enough to program the chip. While it contains the register map and bit definitions, it does not explain why what values need to be set and how they all depend on each other. It turns out that this essential information is sprinkled over at least seven separate application nodes you need to first find and then download in addition to the datasheet. As a public service, here's a list and links to the important ones, especially the last one is absolutely crucial for configuration. Amongst other things, it explains how to do some kind of auto configuration that relieves you from manually calculating and setting some of the most fundamental configuration values. You find this list in the description of the video. Here's a quick view of the program running on the Enviro Plus display for the squares and the circles. I'm just commenting on the MPR1 specifics and not on how to draw things on the LCD. The driver is instantiated with a chip's operating voltage of 3.3 volts and the I2C bus address. The voltage is needed for the auto config operation. And the next line is to check the out of range register, which should be all zeros if auto config succeeded. I have never seen it fail. The next line turns off proximity mode which is the virtual 13th electrode, since I'm not using it in this test. In the while loop, I'm reading the touch status and all capacitance values in one go by calling mpr121.filtered. There are other functions in the driver that just report whether the electrodes are pressed or not, or to return capacitance values, but this one gives everything in one go, as a snapshot, so to say, which ensures that the values are consistent with each other. For convenience, I then convert the bits of the touch status into an array of booleans and do the same with the electrode capacitance values. At the same time, I create a string showing which electrode was touched. This bit here uses the ratio of the capacitance of electrodes 0 and 1 to calculate a color. The rest is very straightforward. Depending on the touch status, the program draws a circle and rectangle and either fill or not. And that basically is all there is. Auto config and sensible defaults make using the MPR121 very easy. But if you really need to, you can change the default configuration. For future use in the Enviro Plus project, I used LibreOffice Draw to design a front panel that looked like this. The blue part is the Enviro Plus board with the dark blue showing the locations of the LCD and the other sensors. The brownish rectangles are touch sensors. I'm planning to use copper foil instead of kitchen foil because that allows you to solder wires to it. You see that I'm using all 12 electrodes of the MPR121. Electrodes 2 to 11 are simple buttons while electrodes 0 and 1 are long bars. If I enable the button overlay You can see that this creates 20 buttons. The idea is that touching some buttons will straddle two electrodes and therefore causes two touches to be registered. For example, button 11 is recognized when button 1 and 0 are both touched. Button 2 and 0 gives 12 and so on. Theoretically, I could have combined both bars to gain an extra button but I think 20 will be probably enough. But how reliable is this method? I decided to do a mock-up first. My rather crude but to scale mock-up of the drawing you just saw. It is using self-adhesive copper foil and soldering the wires to it was no problem. 
What I did not think about is that since this is the underside of the front panel, everything should have been mirrored, but for a function test this does not matter. I changed the program on the Enviro Plus to just display the button number and I indicated the center of the buttons with a blue felt tip marker. In real life the panel would of course show printed buttons with labels instead. As you can see the results are disappointing. Of course the direct buttons are no problem, but the ones formed by the combination of two buttons are very hit and miss. The detection is very sensitive to minute differences in the way and exact location of the touch. I think as it stands this is not suitable as a user interface. Interestingly the upper block worked slightly better and since this has a shorter bar it got me thinking that on the relative large bar area below the partial overlap of my finger causes only a relative minute capacitance change. So maybe those bars should be much thinner than the standard buttons. Alternatively, maybe I could improve the behavior by reducing the detection threshold for the bars to make them much more sensitive. Changing sensitivity is easy to try. I just added these two lines to override the standard configuration for all buttons. By default the touch threshold is 12 and release 6, but for the two bar shaped electrodes I changed it to 6 and 3. This means the deviation of just 6 from the baseline value for the bar electrodes is already sufficient to register as a touch. I think you'll agree that with this simple configuration change the behavior is much better now, but still not perfect. Depending on what functions these buttons will eventually have, misinterpreted buttons could be an immensely frustrating user experience. Just imagine one does for example save and the other delete. So back to the drawing board. I decided to forego the idea of the overlapping buttons as it is too error prone and I try this layout instead. If I enable the button overlay You see this creates 22 buttons. The idea here is that the big bar at the bottom is a shift key. Each of the other 11 buttons has two functions. One that is reached by just touching it and the other by first touching shift and then the button. Let's see how that works in a test. I desoldered all the wires from the previous mock-up and onto the new layout in the other corner. This time I did remember to mirror the button layout so it matched the design. One slight problem with the new mock-up is that the wires preventing the panel from lying flat when reversed. In the real front panel there will be holes drilled under each button so the wire can pass through. As you would expect touching the individual buttons works exactly as it should. To get to the second function, the shift key needs to be pressed first and of course this works just as well. I think this method may be less elegant but far less error prone and I will probably use it for the actual Enviro Plus project but that is for a future video. For now that is it for this video, thanks for watching.